Well, welcome everyone to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. Today, we are in for a treat as my client, Gabby Natali, is here. We are going to talk about being a pioneer in speaking. Welcome to the podcast, Gabby. Hola, Jane. Hello, everyone. Nice. I'm very happy to be here joining you today. Well, I am so excited. You know, being a pioneer is kind of what you talk about all day, every day. But t so let's talk about where you kind of sit with your business model today. What kind of work are you doing? These exciting packages that you're doing. And then we'll kind of start back at your history and really share how you got here. Absolutely. So I work mostly with uh, um, global corporations, Fortune 500 co uh, companies. Mm -hmm. I will say that there's a specific industry. I have clients who are in tech. I have clients who are in real estate, uh, financial. So it's across many industries. But the commonality is that they are companies who want to pioneer, who want to disrupt, who want to innovate, who want to see um, something new in their industry, and who also want to uh, make sure that their workforce and whoever is associated with them can mm -hmm. see uh, what, I, what I have as a message, which is to see the world from a place of possibilities, to disrupt and pioneer. So uh, these are global corporations, and I have from keynotes to training to packages, as you mentioned. So it's a wide variety of different offerings that I have uh, specifically for this type of clients. And I think probably for some of those clients, you being up on stage may very well be the first Latina they've ever had representing. So you're actually expanding their representation as well, hey? 99.9% .9 of the cases, I am the first Latina uh, a lot of times. And that also sends a powerful message uh, to the audience, uh, to their workforce, because they many, many times they have uh, these uh, Latino employees or employees coming from different minorities who say like, this is the first time somebody who has a big fat, fat accent like me is on a stage. This is the first time that somebody is sharing stories that include some kind of firsthand uh, story of being an immigrant and how to make it and how you go, can go from A to B uh, by embracing all of who you are, by smashing stereotypes, uh, by believing in yourself so more when sometimes you have to face bias or you have to face uh, low expectations about who you are or your community. Uh, yeah. So 99.9% of the cases, yes, that's true. Yes. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's go back to where you grew up and what precipitated you coming over to America. Absolutely. So um, I am from Argentina, South America, and I graduated with a master's degree in journalism. And as any graduate who is passionate about starting this new chapter of their lives, I wanted to take over the world. But the world had a very different plan for me because in the year 2001, when I graduated uh, in Argentina, uh, there were 20% unemployment. It was a big crisis, riots in the streets, uh, a lot of political instability, five presidents in 10 days. Uh, so you can imagine I was knocking on doors of different media outlets, TV, radio, newspapers, and saying, hey, I want to join your workforce and I want to join your team. And they were telling me like, okay, but today I'm, today I'm laying off 20% of our employees. So it was not an ideal situation. And I spent almost two years unemployed. And I always uh, say, Jane, that when you spend a long time unemployed and in recession, uh, you start to believe that this lack of response from companies, uh, from employers, is a reflection of who you are as a professional or as a person even, we mistakenly make that assumption. And I was, on, I mean, I was under that impression. And um, the, you asked me about why I came here or how I came here. Yeah. So I was in this uh, kind of limbo, you know, uh, didn't know what to do. And a friend of mine uh, asked me to help her. Uh, she was coordinating an international summit, an international conference, and they had professors coming from different parts of the world. And she said, you know, I want you to come help me. 
I thought it was going to be to come help her as a journalist, as a paid journalist, but actually what she wanted, Jane, was somebody who would hand out flyers and oh, would move dear. the chairs. And I felt at that time that that was the irrefutable proof that I was a loser, that I had studied so much, that I had prepared so much for big things in my life, but that I quote unquote ended up doing unpaid work that was somehow beneath what I had studied. But check this out. Uh, my mother called and she asked me, like, why are you feeling so low? You don't want to go help your friend. And I said, like, I'm a loser. And she asked me a question that changed the trajectory of my life. She asked me, do you have anything better to do with your time, Gabby? And I said, no, I'm unemployed. So she said, this is what you're going to do tomorrow. Tomorrow you're going to put your best clothes, your best attitude, red lipstick, and you are going to work with your... Uh, a game because you never know when opportunities will knock on your door. Mm -hmm. So I went there and little did I know, like I always say, mama es bruja, which means my, my mother is some kind of fortune teller, you know? Ah, bruja, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, because what happened was that by noon, my friend came and she said, uh, the translator canceled. I know you are bilingual and I have this delegation of professors from George Washington University and nobody's here to translate for them. Would you please help me save the day, translate for them? So I dropped the chairs, I dropped the flyers, I started translating. And to make a long story short, that connection that I made that day uh, was the beginning of what we now call telework. There was no word at the time for that. And then when probably a year after that, they had an opening for somebody bilingual in a public relations firm that they led in Washington, D.C. Guess who was first in line to get the offer? Gabi Natale. So really, sometimes when you feel like you're about to give up, mm. push a little bit harder because that might be the day your whole life changes. Oh, I love that story. <laughs> and that is not, you know, feeling like, a, like it, when you've lost your mojo, which I think can happen to speakers just after a series of more than one, you didn't get this engagement, right? Mm -hmm. It's very easy for, it, if the phone hasn't rang for a week, it's very easy to start to lose your mojo. So here you are after two years of unemployment feeling the same thing and you were still able to pick yourself up and become a pioneer. There was a time when you were afraid and it was like a contest or something. What was, well, talk about this contest. I read about this in your book. Talk about yes. this contest that you were like, oh no, this isn't for me. So I was working as a news anchor uh, and as a journalist. So many times we, we get asked to moderate a panel or to MC events. Uh, so that was back when I was working uh, full time as a news anchor. Okay. And so what happened was that uh, somebody invited me to an activity that is called Storytellers uh, in a conference called We All Grow, that I love it. And I agreed and in, you know, it was a different type of experience because it was not moderating a panel or being the MC, which was the type of things I was so familiar with and in a way protected me because I was there in the role of the MC, in the role of the moderator. I didn't have to share a lot about me. The role protected me. Mm. But this time for this conference, We All Grow, what they asked me was to share a real life story uh, about my journey in 13 minutes. Okay. And I agreed without thinking that much <laughs> But as the day got closer, I started getting cold feet and I said like, ah, why did I agree to this engagement? Why did I agree to share something? And I knew in the audience there were going to be clients, people in my industry. So I felt that maybe if I, if I shared something personal, it would even hurt my business. It could even hurt my reputation in a way. But I said, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to be truthful. So I shared uh, some of the stories about being unemployed in Argentina. And I said, like, uh, 
I'm not gonna care so much about being perfect. I'm just gonna be truthful because I am convinced that the most important thing we have as communicator, as communicators and as speakers is our truth and also our energy. Uh, 80% of what we communicate is not the words that we say, it's not, you know, the perfect delivery, it is how you show up for people. Uh, so I went there and I opened my heart, shared these stories, and I connected with people. And as I was walking down the stage, I already felt, Jane, that I had won something. And what I won was to conquer my fear of opening my heart in front of a large audience instead of being the, the serious reporter. Yeah, because isn't it one of the rules of journalism to never become the story yourself, right? So you're coming out from, you know, kind of out, out in front of the camera to be the person who's like the show, but it's usually you're highlighting somebody else, not yourself. And so this was you saying, all right, I'm okay being in the spotlight, huge. And I was not okay at all being in the spotlight. <laughs> so what I didn't know, because I felt already like, hey, I won. I won by opening my heart and conquering my fear. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't know was that there was a literary agent in the audience. She heard my story. She heard my delivery. So how I connected with the audience. Mm -hmm. And so the following week, she reached out to me and said like, there's a book here. And I said, yes, there is a book. I had already done like the first draft of the Virtuous Circle, my book. And within three months, we had a book offer uh, from HarperCollins. Uh, so it was first published in Spanish and then years later published in English. And I became the first Latina author to be published by the leadership division of HarperCollins and to narrate also my own audiobook, which is a whole different story for somebody who's not your traditional author slash narrator. Yeah, you had to fight mm -hmm. to you had to fight to actually be the narrator of your own audiobook because of your accent. And so number one, you're a pioneer at being on that stage and doing so well, but also a pioneer in terms of first Latina author with Harper Collins, signed to Harper Collins, and then fighting to audio to narrate your own audiobook. I mean, imagine, a, a speaker them saying no you can't it's got to be somebody else without an accent like no and i'm so proud of you for fighting for that that is amazing and also imagine a book that tells the story of an immigrant like with somebody whose you know sound doesn't really resemble the story they are telling so it makes no sense at all <laughs> that makes no sense whatsoever um, the other things that you have done, uh, so kind of fast forwarding to something more recent, uh, talk a little bit about JP Morgan Chase. So, you know, you taking risks, uh, we've talked a little bit about that. Talk about something that just happened recently with JP Morgan. Absolutely. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in New York, uh, to keynote JP Morgan Chase, uh, Global Day of Leadership, and it was, they have a couple of thousand people's, people in person, and they have about 20,000 people uh, connecting from around the world. And as I was thinking about this engagement, uh, you know, sometimes you start thinking, how can I customize to better serve this audience? Or what are the adjustments that I have to do uh, to bring value and to connect better with this audience? So. One of the things that I ask myself is, I always dance, you know, when I do my keynotes and, and I always like to bring a lot of my personality and not just the tools, but I mix humor and I mix uh, emotions. And I said like, this is a financial sector, so probably it's gonna be more conservative. In my mind, I, this is what I had as a prejudice. So uh, maybe it's going to be more of a conservative audience and I don't know how they're going to react with all the colors and the dancing. Uh, and then I also thought, how can I customize it? And I said, like, this is people who hired me. 
not in spite of who I am, but because of who I am. And that's such an important thing to realize. Uh, whoever is already interested in you is not in spite of who you are or your message. It's because of who you are and your message. So what I did is I commissioned like an, uh, special remix to get there, to, uh, to really start with a lot of energy and 25 seconds of dancing, which they love because we were coming from a virtual uh, session before. So the energy of the room completely changed. I kept my colors, was dressed in red and pink at the same time and kept 100% of my personality and what I thought was the core of my message and my style. And it was such a big hit that really made me think so much about the importance of not making assumptions first about your audience because uh, you may think uh, a certain industry or certain people are one way or another and they are not. And the second one is like if you are trying to change who you are to please each audience, which is something different than customizing, not customizing, but changing the core of who you are for each audience, it's like going to a restaurant where they have a specialty and let's say the specialty is cheesecake and then people are going to that restaurant because they love the cheesecake and they heard the cheesecake was wonderful and you are serving <laughs> something else and you are serving uh i don't know sandwich and so like i came here for the cheesecake but why are you bringing me a sandwich <laughs> it's crazy but that's sometimes what happens when we're starting to second guess ourselves so that's why i'm so happy that i went one million percent which which uh, with the things I believed were the best to serve that audience. I love that authenticity coming through, bringing your whole self. And how often have we thought, oh, you know, this is a really, you, you know, uh, buttoned up corporate audience, suits and ties. I better be this way. But you know what? They're hiring you for you. So mm -hmm. be you. <laughs> I think that is such a really important message for today. And the fact that, Jay, you know, you're blowing up Times Square with JP Morgan Chase was just a beautiful thing. Now, one of the things I want to mention is if you all are, are watching this on YouTube, you're actually seeing Gabby's studio that's behind her. She is actually an Emmy Award winning television host as well. Talk a little bit about your studio and winning an, not just one Emmy, is it two? Three. Three Emmys. National Emmys, yes. Hello, this is yes. crazy. Okay, so talk a little bit about your studio and what all uh, you have done in terms of kind of TV. Well, I always say that discomfort is our wake up call to pioneer. And that's exactly what happened to me. I was working uh, in TV first as an employee and I, I realized that I was pushed to be put in one of these two media persona, stereotypical ones, media persona number one, it's the hypersexualized Latina, the sexy reporter who is usually assigned to entertainment and weather. That was not me. Mm -hmm. And the second one was like this formal news anchor with a deep voice and a robotic delivery. And that was not me either because I'm spontaneous. But I realized that if I wanted to move forward uh, in the path that I had, they were expecting for me to embody someone that I was not. And I could do it. I was able to do it if I wanted to. But in the way of doing that, I would be somebody who is very unhappy. Uh, so I don't want to be a wannabe. I want to be me. I want to bring all that I am uh, to whatever I'm doing. So I quit my job. As New Suncor, everybody told me that I was crazy, but I created my own media company, Agonar Media, and I credit that decision with everything that happened next, the three Emmys, the possibility of becoming a published author, first Latina in HarperCollins, and this career as a speaker, because it all comes from a place of truth, from a place of, I always say, uh, the difference, Jane, between emulator and pioneer, Emulator is somebody who looks around, see what everyone else is doing, and then want to set their future goals based on someone else's past result. You want to emulate their achievements, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But if we all emulate our best case scenario, 
is the status quo. Everything is gonna stay the same if we all emulate. The second choice is what I call the pioneer spirit. To pioneer, it starts in the same way. You look around, see uh, what everyone like you is, do is doing, but only this time you open yourself up to the possibility of doing something no one else like you has done before. You open yourself up to the possibility of being a pioneer and that's what I did unconsciously in that moment. I didn't want it to be the sexy one. I didn't want it to be the formal news, news anchor. I wanted to be who I was. And I always say, and this is not just for the speaking industry, for, but for every industry. Mm -hmm. Every industry has blind spots. Mm -hmm. And the flip side of a blind spot is a white space mm -hmm. of opportunity. So. Wherever you're working, whatever you're doing, think about one, what is the blind spot that you're seeing? And the second one, what is the white space of opportunity? And if you pioneer and get there first, you're gonna have so many more opportunities because instead of fighting with each other for that single opportunity that everybody wants to get, you're going to open a new space for yourself that you can claim as your own. And that was exactly what happened with my own career. Mm. I love that. I love that. And your statistics just keep growing. Uh, 2018, People Magazine named you one of the 25 most powerful Latinas. You have 52 million, that's with an M people, mm -hmm. views on YouTube. 250,000 followers on social media. You have built an empire for yourself. And I just... I, I just want you to bask in that for a second <laughs> and go, yeah, actually, I have really done that. What do you think, uh, well, talk about YouTube just for a second, 250 million views, or sorry, 52 million views. What was the, uh, was there one thing in particular that went viral for you on YouTube or has it just been all accumulation of a bunch? It's, it's funny because I always joke that I would love to say that I was this visionary when I started my YouTube channel and that I saw the future of technology because I started uploading content, I think it was in the year 2009, 2007, so it's a while ago. But in all honesty, Jane, I have to be honest, I wanted my mother to see my videos in Argentina. And the easiest way for me, I mean, the files were so big, I started uploading my work in YouTube so that my mother could see it on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. And it started to take a life on its own. I didn't know if it was private, public, unlisted. Like I, I was not that sophisticated with like the privacy settings. So I started uploading what I was doing so that my mother could see it in Argentina. And all of a sudden, a lot more people, people other than my mother started <laughs> watching it, <laughs> leaving comments. Uh, and I don't think there's a particular, I mean, there are some videos that have more traction than others, mm -hmm. but I would say it's a combination, you know, it's a combination of being intentional throughout the years and, um, and really sharing something that I felt, you know, was of value with my audience because I never chased what was hot in the moment. I never chased whatever were the, you know, the buzzwords or the buzz topics of the moment. Whenever I had a conversation or an interview with someone, it was always what I cared to offer to my audience, which is what is your journey? Tell me how you overcame adversity. Tell me what, are, what were the things that you learned uh, throughout your journey, whether it is Deepak Chopra, Carlos Santana, the queen of telenovelas, Thalia. So many different people who sometimes they get asked other type of questions, but for me is tell me about your journey, your setbacks and how you overcame it and how we can learn from that. I love it. I love it. <clears throat> so let's talk just for a second here before we wrap up about some of the current work that you're doing. This is brand new. Uh, you are putting together and we've talked them through these packages. Uh, you've got a contract with a very large cosmetics company that everybody would know. And why did they want you and what are you helping them achieve? 
So yes, I have this, this big contract with uh, this global uh, cosmetic company that has 23 brands that I love, all of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> me a gift basket. <laughs> uh, but what I'm seeing, not just in this company, but I work with many corporations, is that there is a new wave of vibrant leaders, vibrant and diverse leaders who need tools and need training, uh, need to break barriers, and they somehow are finding ways of being what they cannot see yet in the world. Mm -hmm. But the, the leadership trainings that many times they have uh, are taught by people or programs that do not resemble their experience. So there are things that are never discussed, like accentism, for example, that many of us have to face, yes. or uh, about being the first one in your family in a corporate environment, or you know, so many things that have to do with upward social mobility and breaking barriers uh, that are not usually addressed in conventional leadership programs. That's why I created the, not just the keynote pioneers, but also the pioneers leadership program for this new diverse and vibrant uh, wave of, of, of leaders who are in themselves pioneers uh, in their workplaces. I love that. And I think that I'm hoping that, you know, a few more years from now, maybe not a decade, but a few more years from now, representation will be seen at the boardroom level in the c-suite that there will be mm -hmm. more uh a more diverse group of people other than uh, the middle-aged white guy that we have yes well in terms of gender we have a long way to go as well yes yes exactly um gabby where should people connect with you if they're curious uh, to learn more about you would you like them to go to your website or connect with you on one of the social medias what's the best way Absolutely. My website, gabinatale.com, G-A-B-Y-N-A-T-A-L-E.com, gabinatale. And then at gabinatale in every platform, Twitter, uh, Instagram, um, in YouTube, you can look for me. I opened recently a TikTok account. You know, I'm not your most um, experienced TikToker, but I'm getting there. <laughs> Uh, so I try to experiment with all different types of platforms because we always want to be, um, you know, seeing what's happening in the moment. Yes, current. Pioneers, I love that. Thank you so much for coming on the show and for sharing your story. And I think the authentic voice that you bring to it is going to be really refreshing for people. And uh, I hope that people will be encouraged to be pioneers themselves. Thank you very much. I truly appreciate uh, this space and all your guidance in the speaking world, Jane. Thank you so much. And everyone, connect with me. Don't be shy. Okay. Thank you all so much, everybody, for listening. We will see you soon, Wealthy Speakers. Bye for now.